Michelle. Let me let me yeah. read a, read at least two lines about your bio. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, Brian is a fascinating scientist. He's a professor of psychology and neuroscience at Stanford University, and you can read his bio at uh, lasertalks.com or on his uh, Stanford page. Uh, in recent years, his team has shown that the brain activity is a good predictor of which videos will go viral, uh, which crowdfunding campaigns are the most likely to succeed, and recently, even on what stock prices will do. <clears throat> okay, all yours. Thank you, Piero. Um, I will talk about neural forecasting in the Q&A if you guys want to talk, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to try to do, is cover the last 20 years of research uh, just with a few examples to try to help you under, to understand how um, approaching the brain to behavior link with a what we call a deep science approach uh, might complement what I would call a broad science approach. Um, so what do I mean by that? Oh, this is a little roadmap. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I mean by deep science. Then I'm going to provide some findings, uh, which uh, we call localization. That's just finding parts of the brain that we think are important for these phenomena. Uh, linking down to the physiology and linking up uh, to choice or to be behavior, and then to discuss some implications if there's time. Uh, for the first time in a long time, in, in at least my field, psychology and also in neuroscience, we have more data than theory. We're uh, besieged with, inundated with data, uh, and not just at, at the macro scale, but at the micro scale uh, with brain data, and not just for animals, but also for humans. So the, the problem that we face right now is what to do with all this data. Uh, and how to use it to inform uh, our explanations of behavior. Um, a long time ago, I was in grad school at Stanford, and I'm lucky enough to be back there now. And I had a mentor named David Rummelhart. Um, among other things, he was responsible for the idea of connectionist networks, which uh, led to deep learning, which we have now. And one thing he said to me, I don't remember exactly, but it went something like this. To understand something, try to explain it at one level above and one level below the phenomenon. And uh, this stuck with me. Uh, I don't know if it's a, a good, efficient way of doing things, but it seemed like a really interesting way to, to try to approach a scientific problem. Um, so tonight I wanna distinguish between two possible approaches to science, uh, to understanding the brain and how it's related to behavior. One is what I call broad science. Uh, this is to take all the data and try to understand it at one level of analysis. Could be all, all the neurons in a nematode or a worm. Uh, it could be uh, modeling the brain of a fruit fly. Uh, and then once you have all the observations at that level analysis, sort of link those observations and then hope that some truth emerges from that. Another approach, which is complementary, I think uh, I would call deep science. So that is to measure critical nodes at a level of analysis, say the neurons and other levels of analysis adjacent to that, say a behavior, try to link those nodes, try to find strong links from one level of analysis to the other. Causal links is what I mean when I say strong. And then uh, once you've established those links to, to branch out within the levels of analysis. Um, uh, when I say levels of analysis, some of you who have a uh, background in neuroscience or psychology may be thinking of David Marr's uh, framework, which is a famous one for thinking about different levels of analysis. Uh, and he described three levels of analysis, the computational level of analysis, which is really the, what you're trying to do, the goal. Uh, the algorithmic, that's a uh, how you're trying to enact the goal and the implementational level, which is sort of the hardware that allows you uh, to enact the algorithms that get you to the goal. He was studying vision. He was trying to understand how um, the visual cortex could um, identify objects. Uh, and he modeled the brain as a computer, an information processor. This is a, a still an influential analogy that is used uh, in most of the fields that I'm adjacent to. We think this is a useful way of thinking of levels of analysis, but with some tweaks for uh, what we're interested in, which is how people feel about things and what they do about them. Um, so uh, we think that instead of starting at this high level of analysis, this computation, the goal level, maybe we should start with the physiology because there's at least as many theorists as there are, um, uh, or theories I should say, as there are brain circuits for doing something. Uh, and then try to understand how those uh, circuits uh, process something and, then, and, and, there, and use that to constrain uh, the purpose explanation. Also, we think the analogy of the information processor may not be totally accurate when you're describing uh, how a human processes different choice options and makes a decision. We think the goal may not be 
uh, informational accuracy and may instead be what we call uh, hedonic sharpening or understanding the implications of that information for me and my survival and thriving and then acting uh, rapidly on the, the, those subjective impressions. Um, so uh, I could go into much more detail on that, but I'm going to now jump to data that's been collected in the last 20 years that we think can bear upon this way of thinking about and analyzing the brain to behavior link. Um, now for a no long time in psychology, which is not that old of a field, it's about 120 years old uh, since uh, Wilhelm Wundt's lab in Leipzig, Germany. Um, we've understood that people do have subjective reactions that vary in response to objectively similar stimuli. Uh, one way of describing those reactions is in terms of categorical emotions. Another way is dimensional sort of um, affective response is what we call them. These dimensional responses as foretold by Wundt and um, verified by over a century of factor analyses of uh, emotional self-reports uh, fall along two orthogonal axes. This one uh, goes from good to bad, it's valence. And the second goes from high to low and it's uh, an arousal axis. What's interesting about uh, this so-called affective circumplex is not just that you can organize different categories of emotions somewhat imperfectly along it, but also that certain quadrants of this circumplex have implications, we think, for behavior, so that if you're feeling positive and aroused, that may facilitate approach towards something, whereas if you're feeling negative and aroused, that may facilitate instead avoidance of the same thing. And another implication of this circumplex is that these dimensions are not um, they're, they are independent, so they are not um, negatively correlated. So you could have both negative and positive reactions to something. You could be conflicted about what to do until one of these sort of impulses dominates and you either approach or avoid. So this should happen pro uh, in risky scenarios, for instance. So what's the evidence for this? Um, I'm not gonna go into too much detail on this slide. This just describes two new fields of research, affective neuroscience and neuroeconomics uh, that aren't very old. They're about 20 years old, 25 years old. Uh, and they ask relevant questions here. Which brain mechanisms anticipate good and bad events, subjectively bad, good and bad? And does their activity influence choice? Uh, so uh, this, these are sort of basic questions in these fields. And I think the reason that there's been a, there have been advances in these fields is because of the new technology we have now to look into the brain as people are choosing and even before people are choosing. Uh, where would we look in the brain? Well, there's a lot of animal research going back at least to the 1950s suggesting that if you stick an electrode in the brain of rats, dogs, monkeys, and humans, that they will work very hard to stimulate certain parts of their brain. And this doesn't apply to the whole brain. It doesn't apply to most of the cortex. These areas tend to be in the middle of the brain, deep in the brain, and some of the prefrontal cortex. Uh, they also, uh, the ones that elicit this self-stimulation behavior, what this is, is a rat pressing a bar to stimulate its own brain. The rat will continue to do this uh, until it keels over from exhaustion. Um, these areas that support this kind of behavior are innervated by um, a neurotransmitter called dopamine. Uh, we've uh, now recorded dopamine neurons in these different species. Uh, this is uh, the famous work of Wolfram Schultz who recorded these neurons in monkeys. Uh, when he got monkeys not only to receive juice rewards in which the neurons fired in response to, but also to, he, he presented a cue that predicted that rewards would occur. And lo and behold, the neurons didn't just fire to the rewards, but they actually moved their firing to the presentation of the cue that predicted the, the reward, suggesting they weren't just responding to reward, but something about anticipating a reward. He also played a trick on the monkeys. He presented the cue, say it's a tone. The monkey thinks a reward is coming and then did not uh, deliver the juice to the monkeys. And then it turns out these neurons stopped firing, which suggests they do have a valence or a positive component. If the monkey was just surprised, and that caused the neurons to fire, you would expect instead an increase in fire. This is a schematic uh, from the side view of a brain, the head cut in the middle. Uh, and you can see that these neurons lie very deep in the brain, in the brainstem. Uh, this is an area that houses uh, these neurons called the, the, the ventral tegmental area, and it projects up to subcortical and to some cortical regions. Uh, and so an interesting question is, if these neurons are firing in anticipation of rewards, uh, what what drives the animal to feel excited and to approach something? Which of these projections matters? And that's an interesting question, not only for animals, but also for humans. Unfortunately, it was very difficult to answer that question until we had neuroimaging methods with sufficient 
temporal and spatial resolution to observe deep brain activity on the order of seconds. Uh, this, is just a, <laughs> this is just a schematic that I won't ask you to remember uh, that shows that we know something about the anatomical connectivity of these three uh, regions that the dopamine neurons hit. Uh, and so we can learn that from monkeys and it's preserved in humans as well. Uh, when functional magnetic resonance imaging came on the scene in 1992, uh, it did afford this kind of second to second and deep, uh, second to second temporal resolution and deep spatial resolution on the order of millimeters that could allow you to look into these areas as people anticipated rewards. Um, so uh, an interesting question arose as to how to best get people to anticipate rewards. And uh, it turns out people are very variable and their subjective reactions to just about anything, including art, as we heard. Um, so uh, one question arose as to what's a nice uh, way to get to reliably activate these neurons in people. And after my lab tried a lot of different stimuli, we ended up using money. Uh, and it turned out that even graduate students in Bethesda and Palo Alto would work very hard to get money. Uh, and they also were quite excited about the prospect of getting money. So we could uh, set up a very simple video game in which people would expect rewards designated by this cue, wait a couple of seconds, respond to a rapidly presented target. And if they were fast enough, uh, and depending on the cue, they could get rewards. And if they weren't fast enough, they wouldn't get any. Uh, you can manipulate all kinds of things about this video game, including whether the cue signals you might win money or lose money. So you can manipulate the valence component and also how much is at stake. Uh, so you can manipulate sort of the arousal component. Um, so, and you can measure brain activity, not just in response to the outcome, but also as people are anticipating getting these rewards. And to make a long story short, what we saw was that when people anticipated monetary rewards, uh, we saw activation in a subcortical area that corresponded with the area of the rat's brain that elicits self-stimulation called the nucleus cummins, which is innervated by dopamine. Uh, the more people thought they could make, the more activation that we saw but there was also a subjective scaling of the activity such that if you're a person who was very excited about making $5, then you would show a bigger signal increase in this region. Uh, and this region was unique in, in responding just to the anticipated reward level. Other areas in the prefrontal cortex seem to process uh, more sophisticated attributes of the reward, like the, its probability uh, and uh, how likely it was to occur. So why am I showing you this? Why should you care? Well. Once we see this activation and we can show, as I showed in the last slide, that it's related to an affective experience, the experience of feeling good and aroused, which we call positive arousal, we can then test uh, uh, whether activation in this area, controlling for everything that's going into the brain, predicts behavior, predicts choice coming out of the brain. So it's going up a level. Um, so I'm now gonna show you some evidence that that may be the case. Uh, and I'm only gonna show you one piece of evidence, but there's, there are quite a few demonstrations of this in various realms of choice, including investing and shopping. Um, I'm gonna talk about gambling here uh, because it's a very simple paradigm that we can use to test this hypothesis. So remember that I told you that this area of the nucleus of Cummins was active when people thought they could get money. You might be wondering, well, what about when they think they can lose money? Is it the same region or is it a different region? It turns out there's another region that's a little bit lateral to the side of this, still kind of deep in the brain, called the anterior insula that seemed to uh, increase in activation when people thought they might lose money as well as when they thought, thought they might gain money. So we thought maybe if we monitored activity in these areas right before people were gonna take a choice, make a choice that we could predict whether they would approach or avoid that choice. We also think the medial prefrontal cortex is involved but in a more sophisticated way. It is connected to these parts of the brain and provides feedback um, to them at a somewhat later time scale. The prediction for gambles was that the more nucleus of Cummins activity you have before a gamble, controlling for everything else, the more likely you, you will be to take that risk. But the more anterior insula activity you have before taking the gamble, the less likely you'll be able to take that risk. So you'll, you'll like be, be more likely to avoid the risk. I'm gonna show you a few gambles that we used in our experiment to give you an intuition for this. And I'll just describe what most people do. Usually I ask people what they would do, but it's a little trickier on Zoom. So here. Here's a gamble I might offer you, and I might say, would you, would you be interested in taking that gamble? And I'll tell you right now that most people are not interested in taking this gamble. However, when I present this gamble, usually I get a few people that will take that gamble. Um, so, uh, and when I present this gamble, 
usually I get over 50% of my audience uh, offering to take that gamble. What's interesting about these gambles is that they are um, financially equivalent from a means, mean variance perspective. That means if you take these gambles over and over and over, you would get zero. And they're also uh, uh, equivalent in terms of their variance. So even though you'll get variable outcomes, on average, the variability will be the same across gambles. However, people do reliably show this preference. Uh, this is just um, showing that when we run experiments, we see people preferring this gamble, which I'll call the positive skewed gamble. Why? Well, we can look in the brain. We can offer people these gambles. Uh, we can collect fMRI as they're deliberating over whether to take these gambles or not. And we can offer them real money so that they're, they're playing uh, for something that counts. And what we do, what one analysis that we can do is just simply ask a classifier or a statistical analysis to pick out the parts of the brain that predict you're more likely to take the risk and the parts that predict you're less likely to take the risk. And when we do that, we get a pattern like this that generalizes across subjects. These areas are in the nucleus of commons that I talked about. They predict that people on average will be more likely to take the risk. However, this anterior insula activity and some activity in the uh, anterior cingulate predict that they will be less likely to take the risk. This applies to all the gambles. But when we look inside these areas and we try to predict, and I won't try to go into detail on this uh, logistic regression, but when we try to predict why are people more likely to take this positive skewed gamble, uh, what we find is that an interaction between the nucleus accumbens activation and the gamble type, such that the nucleus accumbens really comes online and predicts you're gonna be more likely to take that positive skewed gamble. So we can not only use this kind of activation here to predict uh, what I would call rational gambling, but we can, or, or at least efficient gambling, but we can also use it to predict irrational instances of gambling. It turns out that many of these studies have been done by this time over the last 20 years. There are meta-analyses of these studies. Uh, if you can go into a meta-analytic engine and you can type in words and see what brain activity is associated with those words in the study abstract, and you see an interesting set of patterns that basically are consistent with what I just described. So what have I told you so far? Well, I've told you a couple of things. I've told you that when people are anticipating good and bad outcomes, specifically financial outcomes, but this also applies to other kinds of valenced outcomes, uh, we see different neural circuits activated. Uh, some components of those circuit circuits, when people are about to make a choice, predict that they'll take a risk, while other components predict that they'll be more likely to avoid a risk. So basically that's sort of linking up from brain activity to um, affect and choice. What is causing this brain activity? Well, we can link down as well. Here's the linkage that I was talking about. So you can put these, you can superimpose these levels of analysis on the affective circumflex and make a prediction that, okay, if I see nucleus accumbens activation, people are more likely to be excited and they're more likely to approach something. And there are different uh, predictions I can make based on activation in these other areas. But what is causing this fMRI activation? I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, but I wanna talk a little bit about this because this is another set of methodological advances that have occurred really in the last decade uh, that are very exciting in animal research. And I'm speaking specifically of optogenetics, which was developed by my Stanford colleague, Carl Dyseroff. Um, with optogenetics, you can um, inject a virus into neurons in the brain, uh, specific neurons, uh, which will cause the DNA to construct um, ion channels that respond to specific wavelengths of light. So what that means is that I can go into the brain and I can inject these viruses into dopamine producing neurons. And uh, then I can put in a fiber optic cable and control those neurons specifically with light at the same frequency that dopamine neurons would fire. So this opens up the door to lots of different uh, investigations. It, one thing it allows us to do, if we can train the rats to be still for 45 minutes, which is a challenge, but it's possible, is we can actually now stimulate these dopamine neurons in the rat and ask the question, does the fMRI pattern look the same as people anticipating rewards? And um, uh, well, the, I'll tell you right now that they do, uh, but I'll show you some results that are related to this. So basically rats will work very hard to stimulate uh, their own dopamine neurons with light. So that's good. That's what we would predict. And when there's an inactive compound put in their brains, they won't work to stimulate the lever. Uh, 
But what we additionally see is when we put animals in a scanner and we stimulate these neurons at the same frequency that dopamine neurons would naturally um, fire, or say 20 hertz for two seconds, we see a beautiful pattern of activity ipsilateral to the uh, stimulation in the striatum, including the dorsal striatum and the ventral striatum. So these are the, this ventral striatum uh, is, uh, is similar to the nucleus accumbens that we saw in humans. It's also the nucleus accumbens in rats. Um, and when we inhibit these neurons with another opsin, uh, we see a slight decrease in activity. Uh, there are, again, more interesting things that are happening in the prefrontal cortex. When we stimulate those neurons, they tend to modulate what's going on down here in the striatum of the rat. I won't go into detail on that, but that's an interesting part of the story as well. We also see that the more that the nucleus accumbens of the rats is activated by this light stimulation, the more they prefer to self-administer that stimulation. So there's a correlation between them. So that suggests that not only can we go from the dopamine neurons to the fMRI activity, but we can also link it to the behavior of the rats and by analogy, the humans. Okay, so that's uh, linking down a level. Um, we think that rats will work for this optogenetic stimulation of dopamine neurons, uh, and that creates that increases the striatal fMRI activity, uh, analogous to what we're seeing in humans, and, the, and the inhibition will decrease that striatal activity. So that's going down a level. So notice what I'm doing here. I'm sort of not going. I'm not trying to describe the whole circle. I'm trying to actually go in an arrow uh, from one level to the next. That's sort of the deep science idea. So what are some implications? I've gone through this very fast and I apologize for that. Um, and I'll describe a few and maybe we can discuss them later if there's more time. We think that these findings so far support linking levels of analysis. We think dopamine neuron firing, and this is at the same time scale, increases nucleus accumbens activity, which increases positive arousal or excitement, if you wanna call it that, which increases the, increases the tendency to approach, which may or may not be manifested in a probabilistic way, Whereas other neurotransmitters, nor norepinephrine is currently our best candidate, increase anterior insula activity, which increases negative or general arousal and is more likely to increase avoidance. These are falsifiable hypotheses that are sp specific in terms of time. So this is an example, I think, that deep science may complement the broad science approaches. It has a lot of costs. It's difficult, it's expensive. It really requires collaboration and coordination. It's slower, uh, but I think it, once you get an answer, it may actually speed translation and intervention. Um, I mainly talked about choice. Uh, we think there are many app implications. One is maybe to prostheses uh, and choice architecture. That is, if I can understand the mechanisms that drive choice, subjective mechanisms, then I can understand how to make better prostheses. And by prostheses, I don't just mean like, you know, fake arms, but I mean uh, like, you know, an iPhone that uh, gives me a prefrontal cortex that, that can um, modulate what's going on down below uh, so that I make more optimal choices for my long-term self. Um, an interesting question is how aware are people of what's going on in their brain uh, if it's driving their choices? And we don't have a good answer for that yet, although we're looking at it, we're investigating it. Another question is, given that we can surgically dissect choice before it happens, um, which of those components generalize to other people? And we have some evidence, as uh, Piero mentioned, that not all of them do, that the, the deep ones tend to generalize better than uh, the ones that are closer to the actual choice behavior. We also think this has implications for theories. We think we can use this information to improve choice models that exist of, of for instance, rational actor models uh, with neural constraints. Uh, we think obviously we can go to additional levels of analysis, not just individual choice, but aggregate choice. And this is sort of the scientific goal, but we want to move beyond description and explanation to prediction and even to control. Um, and I won't go into detail, but there are, we are collaborating with a surgeon, Casey Halpern, to look at direct stimulation and measurement of these circuits in people with very serious psychiatric uh, disorders. Uh, so I'll end with thanks uh, to my collaborators, my interdisciplinary collaborators, without whom this would not be possible. And if those of you who are local should check out the NeuroChoice Initiative. Um, it's specifically uh, dedicated towards spanning these levels of analysis. And right now we're focusing on addiction uh, and also the people that have supported this research in you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, you want to spend a few seconds uh, talking about this, this uh, model to predict what the stock prices will do? 
<laughs> right. Okay. So um, yeah, we just published something in the Journal of Neuroscience, which was covered in some news sources like The Guardian. So if you want, if you want to read about that, it's in, it's on Google. Um, and uh, it was a, an ambitious uh, project, uh, which was funded by NeuroChoice, in which we wanted to see if we could actually forecast. So for, when I say when I'm talking about individual uh, choice prediction, I use the word prediction. But when I use when I'm talking about out of sample uh, forecasting, I use the for, word forecast. So that's like other people, in, including markets. Um, if you assume that stock prices are driven by people's choices, uh, then increases in prices should indicate more choices and decreases should indicate less. Then an interesting question is whether not only can we use uh, the brain activity to predict what individual people will do when they see stock tickers and they're trading, but also can we average the brain activity and use that to try to forecast what will actually happen to the stock ticker. And so that was the ambitious goal of this project. And we found that we were actually able to do that at least with the anterior insula signal. And again, to cut to the, to the end, uh, what we found was that um, when our, our group's anterior insula activity was high, then the stock ticker that they were looking at was more likely to flip in direction. So it was more likely to go down if it had been going up or vice versa. Um, what was interesting about that is that if you look at our subject's behavior, that did not forecast uh, what was going to happen to the stock ticker. So there seems to be some additional information uh, that we can harvest from the brains if we sort of average them over a group of subjects. Right, which brings us to the question, to the <clears throat> issue of uh, awareness you mentioned in a, in a slide. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so the, we, we know, uh, we don't need neuroscientists, we know that we often we are not aware of the, of the decisions we make, mm -hmm. sometimes very critical decisions. Mm -hmm. And there might be good evolutionary reasons why, you know, sometimes we don't have we don't have, are not aware that mm -hmm. we're jumping if a car is about to hit us. Mm -hmm. uh, but what is there? Is there something that uh, <clears throat> you can tell us about improving our awareness of our decisions? Uh, sometimes we're not aware even after we already made a decision, even mm -hmm. after, I mean, only when we see the consequences, we start realizing, oops, I made that decision. So is there something we can do to improve that awareness? Um, there. I can think of two answers. One is um, we can observe our own behavior. Uh, and even if we're not aware, we can notice what we tend to do in certain situations, especially that surprises us. And then imagine that we'll do that again in the future and set up our environment so that we don't do that. So an example, a dumb example would be like, I set my alarm when I'm supposed to give a talk because I know I'll get engaged in a conversation. I'll forget that I was supposed to do it, but it's a mundane example, but it's an example of this. Uh, and in fact, we serve as each other's prefrontal cortexes all the times. Uh, especially if we have kids or, you know, we have students uh, or maybe, you know, if our, our older, wiser parents uh, will do that as well. They will reflect for us. Um, I think, but you're talking about really about individual awareness. And that's a really interesting question. Like how can we train, what signs or signals can we look for in ourselves? Are they visible? Are they, you know, could we scale out to some external signal? Um, that's something we're interested in looking at right now. And we're actually looking at it in the context of uh, people who, uh, our stimulant users uh, and um, are in treatment for that, trying to, we, we're using brain activity to try to predict once they leave treatment, will they relapse or not? And are they aware of that? Like, can they predict? It turns out they can't, they're the ones we've run, but their brain activity can. So the obvious next question is like, how can we make them aware or help them to be, you know, to, to really understand what's going on in their brain as they're confronted, as we confront them with stimulant cues? And it, have, you, have you noticed any correlation between uh, um, hormones, between uh, dopamine and uh, this level of awareness? I mean, it's, you know, can you see in the future some kind of, I want to call it medication, or some, <laughs> some kind of booster that will improve my awareness <laughs> of what I'm doing? Um, yeah, there are a lot of pharmacological possibilities, um, other possibilities. Uh, include, you know, sort of training your mind, mindfulness or whatever. It's not clear to me that that, that uh, but I think that's the goal, honestly, is to, is not to not have emotions or not to not have affect, but to have it, but to just not act on it right now, you know, to be able to step back and say, okay, I'm having this experience and I'm not going to do anything about it right now. And I can decide later. Um, so, you know, I, I do think that there's a natural fluctuation, but it's shocking to me uh, 
how, much, how fast people decide most things, including highly consequential decisions, uh, even when they don't have to. Um, and so there's, there's some impulse that, uh, I mean, you see this on the internet too, like if you slow down your website or you slow down your video, you lose your viewers, right? Um, so there's, there's some time component to this that is critical uh, that we don't fully understand, but it's probably linked to the dynamics of the neurotransmitters that I'm describing. Um, so I think that both the chemistry and the timing and the psychology could all be helpful in um, maybe you know, reflecting more uh, or making more optimal choices is I guess the way I'd put it. Yeah, and, and to be clear, I mean, uh, emotional reaction is not <clears throat> necessarily bad. In fact, no. in fact, I can think uh, several cases where my instinct uh, made me do something very good. I was rolling down a mountain, uncontrollable fall, and uh, mysteriously, I put my hands in the right place. I stopped myself, and that's probably why I'm still alive. And that was not a rational, you know. No. Decision. Yeah, I mean, so, those are there. We're here because of those, <laughs> right? Yeah, those, right. Our, our contention is affect is there. Uh, as, as you know, the, the evolutionary shorthand for survival and thriving, right? So, uh, and, and it helps you to learn too, by the way. Um, but it's not always perfectly calibrated. You know, we live in these very, well, we live in cities. We live in these human constructed environments. And so um, I still think understanding the mechanism can help us to calibrate them perhaps better. And then I have two questions that are <clears throat> sort of critiques of neuroscience, I mean, positive ones. Mm, sure. uh, one, you triggered the first one when you spoke about the rumor art and the Mar about uh, mm -hmm. studying one level below, one level higher. I mean, the one level higher psychology has been around for 120 years and there's mm -hmm. a lot of people do it. Now, when neuroscientists talk, they tend to talk about uh, regions in the brain, mm -hmm. uh, occasionally about the neuron synapses. Mm -hmm. How far low does it make sense to go? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but we have an, Im an image of the neuron that comes from probably computer science where we think all neurons are just uh, zero one things, mm -hmm. but actually every neuron is different. I mean, mm -hmm. if you go, if you use a microscope, mm -hmm. uh, we have all these billions of neurons they are all different. Mm -hmm. So should we go to, down to that level or mm -hmm. you feel that it's sort of redundant that studying just regions is good enough? I think um, I, I think two things. One, one is resolution is critical. So and and there's it's a sort of a Goldilocks problem. You know, there's you don't want too little, but you don't want too much either. Uh, at each level, you need to know the right level of resolution. So, for instance, Galileo did not use a telescope to see uh, or a, a microscope to see the moons of Jupiter. He used a telescope. He also didn't use a magnifying glass. He, his innovation was not to invent the telescope, but to grind the lens to the appropriate resolution so he could see the moons of Jupiter. Okay, so it's similar with brain imaging. And we don't always know the right resolution in a, in a given scale of analysis. So one nice, and this is the second point, is one nice constraint is actually going across levels of analysis. So having to keep yourself honest to whatever I'm looking at at this level, it has to predict the next level. Okay, and that can, I believe, can help you to hone the resolution at this level uh, to, to the one that's optimal for doing the job of predicting. And um, so psychology is 120 years old, you said. Uh, neuroscience, I don't know where you start because, uh, I mean, in a sense, it's older because you can think of Thomas Willis in the 17th century. 17th? Absolutely, yeah. Galvani, 18th century. And then you have Paul Broca. Yeah. And then, then you know, I don't, I don't know where you start. Thorndike, uh, Hebb, uh, Sperry. <laughs> uh, but certainly the boom, uh, the exponential growth comes with, I guess, as modern machines from the 70s, the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very recent science, right? So absolutely. What level of confidence can we have in neuroscience since it's such a young science? There aren't that many neuroscientists. I think it's a very difficult field. Uh, and as you said, the amount of data just by studying one brain is overwhelming. Yeah, again, I think, I think um, having benchmarks having quantitative results um, allows you then to anchor in, right? And then say, okay, I can predict choice at, you know, 75% above chance 50%. Okay, what other information allows me to do that? How can I optimize my prediction and so forth? So I think 
having those quantitative benchmarks helps us to get out of this sort of relativistic morass of just like a sea of data and I don't know what to do with it. I'm floating in the sea of data and I don't know what to do with it. It structures um, the investigation. Uh, now that may not be your goal. Your, my goal is to predict choice. Your goal may not be to predict choice, um, but it helps, to, um, it, it helps to allow us to move forward. Yeah, if you click on the Q&A, you have a question. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, oh yeah, there are two, okay. Oh, right, okay. The second one. Right. Okay, the question, I'll read it for in case there's uh, people in the audience don't know it. Other than mental illness, are there models that predict uh, a subject to pursue a negative stimulation as opposed to a positive stimulation, right? So this is an interesting question. Are that, it, it sort of speaks to like, well, how, how valenced are these circuits really? And it certainly is the case that most circuits don't elicit this self stimulate this, I'm gonna call it unconditional, right? So you don't have to train the rat that this is a, a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, if you stimulate the nucleus accumbens, it will move forward and its whiskers will go forward. Um, if you stimulate, say, the periaqueductal gray, it will shrink back and it will freeze. Um, so what we're talking about is these circuits that are there and can have an unconditional positive or negative quality. I guess that's what I'm asserting. You might think that, well, maybe in humans, it's not true. Uh, maybe in humans, uh, we don't see this kind of phenomenon. But actually, there are some brain stimulations uh, in humans, mostly conducted in the 50s, that suggest that the same phenomenon may apply. Um, so um, that's not to say that you couldn't uh, change it, you can override it, uh, or it, it's not plastic. It's just that there do seem to be certain chemistries that are associated and, and anatomies that are associated with sort of positive and negative outcomes. And they tend to be deep in the brain. I don't know if the, uh, you might be asking, could you be trained though to approach something negative? And I think that could definitely be the case. You could, could you be trained for instance to, um, uh, right, uh, to finish your dissertation <laughs> or something like that. I think that's definitely the case. Uh, but I guess what, I, what I'm positing is that it will involve more than one of these circuits. Thank you, Brian. And uh, <clears throat> by the way, your talk shows what we miss with Zoom because I noticed that you use your hands. I do, to, I, yeah. I right, my to head explain, and, and I do yeah. the same, actually. And that's <laughs> something you miss with that. And I'm sure it would help. And uh, yeah. that's something you miss with Zoom. Anyway.